And so that's the next step for you. It's great to be here again. And, um, you know, uh, uh, I'm going to take about 20, 25 minutes to just explain to you our current developments and what's available in the scientific arena in terms of using genomics for the detection and treatment of cancer. Now, this is a very controversial area, and I don't want to argue with anyone, but simply I'm going to re reveal to you what I know in this area. I think I'm going to let you know what is available. Uh, I'm not going to make any comments in the clinical setting because you are the experts. I'm not. But I'm just going to uh, advise you on what is currently available and what is possible in terms of technology that would allow us to give us a greater power of detection, even in the early stages of cancer, and possibly some treatment programs. Now, cancer, as you know, develops secondary to genetic and epigenetic changes. Now, often people don't quite realize that every cancer that arises in the body follows up as a pattern where you can see a very precise change in genetic performance and genetic expression. Right? Some of these changes are very subtle, right? For example, smoking takes 10, 20 years to trigger some form of changes like that. And those changes are most, mostly undetected by the medical profession and by the current test. Some of the changes that come through smoking are regulated by mutations that happen in the P53 genome, right? Which is your guardian protein. Now, there are two specific mutations that arise out of that. Uh, change, which actually can actually open the way for cancer to develop in the future. Now, every cancer has a particular genetic and epigenetic change. If you understand cancers, you'll be able to understand those changes. If you can pick up the early signs of genetic changes happening in precancerous lesions, you will be in a much better position to determine whether this is going to become a cancer or not, and roughly when it's going to become a cancer. So cancer does develop uh, secondary to genetic and epigenetic changes of multiple genes and is characterized by extreme variation. So it is almost impossible to detect cancer by any single test. You know, one of the things I learned when I was involved in this area is that cancer actually mutates, in a sense. Cancer cells actually do a genetic rearrangement, so it's almost impossible sometimes to pinpoint exactly the genetic makeup, the silencing profiles of the genes of cancer cells. Every new generation of cancer cells appears to have a slightly different genetic reorganization and, pre and, and, and expression. So uh, this is uh, why it makes cancer very difficult to detect and actually to be controlled by the defense cells in the body. It's also difficult for us to understand the performance of the cancer cells because they are, in fact, changing consistently. Now, in some of the work we've done over the years, we have picked up some of those uh, unraveling and indi indicators of genetic changes in cancers that could potentially become cancer cells. Now, now it is also possible to find cancer cells or what we call free cancer DNA in body fluids, in blood, stools, and sputum, right, from cancer patients. Even when the tumor mass is too small to be visible by the radiological study or endoscopy, right? It is possible to find indicators of the development of transformation of these cells leading to cancer development, even when these tumor masses are invisible or, or not visible by normal means. The detection of cancer in the early stages, of course, um, uh, it provides the best opportunity for, of course, intervention, potential change, and prevention. So the, the general concept of using genomics uh, for cancer testing and, and uh, and potential treatment, I designed that name called Genomics Can Scan. Now, what we try to aim with this program is to provide accurate cancer diagnostic systems for medical and health practitioners. So we can use that in combination with imaging studies to aid conventional health checks and also to improve the sensitivity of conventional tumor markers as well. The main objective eventually is to detect early cancer and even invisible cancer. As you know, cancer takes generations to develop. It takes 20 or 30 years often for the changes and very gradual changes to take place. From the normal cells to the stage 1, 2, or 3, or 4 cancer development, there are numerous changes that take place which are, in fact, invisible to normal technology and, 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 medical, and medical practices, right? What is very important is that can we, in some way or form, pick up the changes that occur in the early stages of cancer to be able to, to actually intervene and potentially change the development of this transformation of the cells to stage one cancer. 
And this is what can, uh, genomic technology can actually do for you, is provide you the early signs of changes which could lead to the development of cancer cells. Some of those changes are very, uh, very uh, obscure. They are actually very, very difficult to detect. But current genetic technology can actually allow us to do that and a lot more. In comparison to what we see as uh, being the most uh, effective way of being able to detect cancer, major conventional cancer systems are in, uh, a lot less accurate. Roughly speaking, when you look at conventional cancer checks, the accuracy is roughly about 50 percent. So about half of the cancers go undetected, simply because you don't have the means to determine that cancer is there or is actually developing, right? when you use hist you know, hist clinical histories, physical examination, protein tumor markers, which are very limited value, radiology, uh, endoscopy, and x-rays, etc., uh, essentially you get a roughly a 50% accuracy uh, of detection uh, by using the traditional means. What we aim to do is to provide, in the future, a test that might be to provide you with more than 90% accuracy in the detection of cancer, including the presence of cancers that are not yet manifested as such, right? The way to do this is by understanding how cancers actually develop and what the genetics of cancer actually is. The first thing you need to look at is mutations, right? Mutations of, override many of the protective mechanisms. Mutations are very important because they can determine the progression of a cancer by switching off or making protective proteins inactive. And one of the examples that I gave you was P53, right? The P53 protein holds the cells in a cycle, uh, in a holding pattern, until the cell repairs. If, if, this, if P53 or the body detects that the cell has no repair, then the cell is destroyed or is instigated to, to commit suicide. When you mutate P53 through smoking and drinking, what you do is that you minimize or reduce the ability of P53 to do the job. The first signature that we find with smokers is a mutation in site 157 of the P53 molecule. Even if people gave up smoking 20 years ago, I can tell you whether a person smoked or not just by looking at that one single mutation, which is, of course, is a lifestyle uh, uh, issue, naturally. So mutations are very important. Now, methylation profiles are also extremely important because the methylation profile determines which gene is being expressed today or not. The methylation profile, and methylation is a mechanism by which you switch genes on and off. And remember, we have two genes in, our, in every cell, right, from mom and from dad. We have a copy from the chromosome of mom and one from dad. Which one is switched on and off at any time? Do you know how that happens? One is silence. One overrides the other. And that is done through methylation. So methylation is a very powerful mechanism. So looking at methylation of genes, somewhere around 18 genes uh, altogether, we can determine where the methylation um, has actually interfered with the activity of genes and the expression of protective genes. We look at microsatellite markers. The microsatellite markers are indicators that show us a certain degree of DNA instability. For a cancer to develop, there needs to be some form of DNA instability in the unraveling of the DNA molecule. Now we can pick up signs of that unraveling and that instability, and we call that microsatellite markers. There are RNA markers that indicate the progression of, tumor, of tumors and also of the precancerous lesions. There are protein markers, which are the ones that you normally rely on, right? And there's also a specific markers like HPV and EBB viruses, which are, they have a close relationship with certain types of cancers, right? The, the method of the test that we propose is very simple, and the, it's more than I propose because we've done a lot of work over the years, but what we would like to show you is how simple the system is. Essentially from plasma and a blood sample, right, you derive most of the information. It could be just a drop of blood. It doesn't have to be full blood. We extract DNA. We look at mutations. We use our DNA sequencing and DNA power chips, which I'm going to explain to you in a minute, and other technology to detect mutations. Then from the same sample, we select proteins, and we look at oncoproteins and tumor antigens. That gives us a, another set of information. From the same blood sample, we select PBMC cells, or mononuclear cells. We extract RNA, and we look at cancer-specific gene markers. And there are about 10 to 15 of those markers that relate to specific cancers.